sure you pause the video and try this question on your own before listening on. It turns out that this question relates to a particular concept when there is a car traveling around a banked turn. The book derives an equation for that situation, so let's introduce it. So in this equation we have the angle theta, which is the angle between the horizontal and the ramp or the road surface that the car is driving on in this banked circular turn situation. G, of course, is the gravitational constant. R would be the radius of the circular path that the car is traveling on, and V is the speed. Now the question mentions that the banked circular highway curve is designed for traffic moving at 60 kilometers per hour. Now, actually, what we want to do is first change that speed into meters per second. That's a pretty easy conversion. If you have any questions about how we set that up, please let me know. But once you simplify that, you get approximately 16.7 meters per second. So with that speed, g and the given radius, we can easily calculate the angle that is necessary on this banked circular turn. And that angle turns out to be approximately 8.07 degrees. Now let's keep in mind that that angle is necessary under ordinary conditions. But in the question, we have extraordinary conditions. We have a rainy day, and it says that traffic is moving along the highway at only 40 kilometers per hour. Now, as before, we have to convert the 40 kilometers per hour into meters per second. So let's just do that real quick. And so that speed becomes 11.1 .1 meters per second. Now to proceed from here, what we'll do is we'll get a closer look at the car as it travels around the circular bank. We know that any object that's traveling in a circle has a centripetal acceleration that's going to be pointing towards the center of that circle. So we would have an acceleration vector pointing in this manner right here. Perhaps we can call that a prime. Now it turns out to be useful to put a sort of reference line here that's parallel to the ramp. Why don't we change the color so we don't confuse it with the acceleration? The reason that that reference line is so important is because it's going to allow us to break the acceleration into its components. There will be an x component that points parallel to the surface of the ramp, so it looks something like that. And then there will be a y component which points perpendicular to the surface of the ramp. We can even label those components a perpendicular and then a parallel. Hopefully that's clear in the picture. Now we're going to be able to come up with expressions for a parallel as well as a perpendicular. All we have to realize is that this angle right here is the same theta as the one down here. Hopefully then from the diagram it's clear that the a parallel is going to equal the a prime times the cosine of the angle and then the a perpendicular is going to equal the a prime times the sine of the angle. Now let's not forget that centripetal accelerations are equal to speed squareds divided by the radius. In this particular case we have the centripetal acceleration broken up into two components. Once again we have the component parallel to the ramp and then the component perpendicular to the ramp. But just like we can set the regular centripetal acceleration equal to v squared over r, we can set the components of the centripetal acceleration equal to v squared over r, so long as we include a cosine of theta term for the parallel component, and then a sine theta for the perpendicular component. So in essence, then, the centripetal acceleration that's parallel to the surface of the ramp is going to equal this expression right here and the centripetal acceleration that's perpendicular to the ramp will equal that expression. So we can kind of cut out the middleman at this point. And these results we're going to hang on to for later. Next, we're going to consider the forces that are acting perpendicular as well as parallel to the ramp. Perpendicular to the ramp, we have the normal force acting in this manner, and then we have the mg cosine theta force. Now that's just the component of the gravitational force that's perpendicular to the ramp. Pretty standard for a ramp situation. In the parallel direction on the ramp we have a couple of forces. We have mg sine theta acting in this manner. It's getting a little tight in there but we'll, we'll squeeze that. So mg sine theta and then we also have the frictional force pointing in this direction. We can label that fs.
Let's consider the direction that's parallel to the surface of the ramp. We will apply Newton's second law, the sum of the forces equals mass times acceleration. As noted, we have two forces. We can take this direction as being positive and this direction as being negative. And so we would have the following forces that are parallel to the surface of the ramp. In the perpendicular direction, we also have two forces. We can note this direction as being positive and then this direction as being negative, and so we can fill in those forces. Now, of course, this is where our expressions for the accelerations parallel and perpendicular to the ramp will come in handy. We can substitute this expression right in for the acceleration here, and then similarly we will substitute that expression in for the acceleration that's perpendicular to the surface of the ramp. Next, we're just going to clean up the workspace. Now what we'll do is solve the first equation for F sub S, the static frictional force. And similarly, we will solve the second equation for the normal force. And now we have purposely stacked those two equations on top of each other because what we're going to do next is we're going to divide them and we're going to see some convenient things happen by doing that. For one thing, mass appears in all four terms of that quotient so we can cancel it out. And then we can plug in all the known values. We know g, of course, the theta particular problem was solved earlier as 8.07 degrees. The speed that we're using right now is the 11.1 meters per second because we're on this special rainy day that's occurring. And then the radius, of course, was given as 200 meters. So we'll plug all the known values in. And when you do that, you should get 0.078 for the ratio of F sub S to F sub N. And indeed, that turns out to be the minimum coefficient of static friction. Let's not forget that the static frictional force is equal to the mu sub s multiplied by the normal force. Well, if we divide that equation by fn on both sides, then we can see, after the fn's cancel, that indeed the mu s, that the coefficient of static friction, is indeed equal to the ratio of f sub s to f sub n. And there we have that ratio, and there we have the value of the coefficient of static friction.